the uh, education component is one piece of the puzzle. And our goal is how do we keep kids in school when their housing situation is not permanent? That's really the key. And so does anyone know why it's called McKinney Vento? This is quite a mouthful. You can no. just pop, pop it in the chat if you have any ideas. Nope. Nobody knows? It is named after the two chief sponsors, Stuart McKinney and Bruce Vento, after both of them um, passed away soon after the act came into, uh, was authorized. So it was the McKinney Act, and then it became the McKinney-Vento Act. I have heard every variation of this. <laughs> Yesterday, I saw one that said McKinney-Venmo. I was like, oh, that's a new one. I haven't seen, seen that before. It's a tricky, it's a tricky mouthful. Um, you can call it the homeless, homeless education, but a lot of families won't identify with homeless. So really thinking about um, the way we talk about this program is important. So part of this law, so federal education law, it does require that we have a state homeless education coordinator, and that is my role. That's what I'm here to do. So I support school districts with technical assistance, providing funding, and professional development. I'm also more than happy to come to your organization or your school and talk about McKinney-Vento and really try to in continue increasing awareness about this program so that we can all have a better understanding um, of what resources are available for when our families come across hard times. If you are the McKinney Vento Liaison, this is a slide for you that really has all of the 10 responsibilities of the liaison. So these are all of the pieces. HCY stands for Homeless Children and Youth, um, that a liaison is responsible for providing in their districts. Some liaisons will have many districts that they cover um, and some will have just one, but these are the responsibilities. We have a really great um, assessing capacity tool for liaisons to be able to go through and see, am I able to do this? Who do I need to ask for help? What is a plan for making this um, more doable, really? Historically, this program has not been funded very much. <laughs> um, it's around 300,000 per year for the entire state of McKinney-Vento funding that we receive. Um, that was the general McKinney-Vento subgrant process, right? Since COVID, we've ha we have received an influx of funding specifically for this population. So First, other funding sources, we have the Title I Part A set aside. Every district is required to reserve some funding for their homeless students. Um, that is an amount that's determined by the district every year as part of their comprehensive needs assessment. We have the McKinney-Vento subgrants, which goes out to seven districts in the state. And then we had American Rescue Plan, Homeless Children and Youth Part 1 and 2, which covers most districts in the state, where most districts received at least $5,000 specifically for their homeless children and youth. And then we have a new subgrant that's there for students experiencing homelessness and multilingual learners. This was a new one that just came out last month um, from the main DOE as part of what they are setting aside with their. Um, state reservation from, uh, from ESSER funding. So that is now newly available. Oh, thank you for those contacts, Sarah. That's really helpful. So Sarah is putting the links in the chat if you wanna look those up. Um, you can see how much has been allocated to your local district. Um, and if you have any questions on funding, that is part of what I'm here for. It's not my favorite, <laughs> my favorite part of my job, but I'll figure it out with you if I don't know the answers. Um, and so when we talk about McKinney-Vento homeless education, it's important to recognize that we have a lot that our kiddos need, right? The physiological needs, the safety and security needs to, of, of Maslow's hierarchy. But then, so there's a lot that this program can offer that are things like school supplies, clothing, transportation, free meals, right? Those physical, tangible things. But there's also a lot of intangible that comes from this program, tutoring, encouragement, sense of belonging, and really, really importantly, hope for the future, right? Um, 
I put this graphic up here, this little cartoon, because a hole in the boat is a hole in the whole boat. And if your district or organization has a hole in McKinney-Vento awareness, that is a hole in the whole boat. Um, my neighbor is a, is a teacher locally, and he came to me the other day and he said, hey, I, I have a question for you. I had a kid come up to me in class and he said that he and his mom had to sleep in their car last night. He said, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I just, I patted him on the shoulder and I said, sorry, bud. He said, what, is there anything else out there? And I was like, ah, yes, there's so much out there. Let's talk about this. Let's connect with your local liaison. Let's get this family connected to services and supports, right? And, and identified for McKinney Vento. Um, and so he was honestly super relieved that there was something that could be done, but he had never heard of, he only knew because I was his neighbor and I said I worked with homeless kids that he could ask me that, right? So really thinking, does everyone in your district or your organization have a basic understanding of this? Because it could be the custodian that a child discloses to. It could be a bus driver that notices a kid's getting on at a different place. Really thinking about all the people who come in contact with kids throughout the day and who have their unique relationships, right? They might be the person that the student feels connected to. So how can we train everyone in the districts? And so with this, um, I like to tell two stories. The first story is a true story about a high school student, and let's call her Brittany. She comes to enroll from a nearby district, and it's clear she hasn't showered, her clothes are wrinkled, and she's very, very tired. Um, she starts enrolling. She starts attending very quickly. Her attendance starts declining. The school tries voicemails, texts, letters home. There's no communication. Um, you hear eventually through the grapevine, you hear the student has officially withdrawn from school and that she is pregnant. And so that's the first part of the story, right? The second part of the story is what, what else could have happened to Brittany. So the second story, we have it start out the exact same way. High schooler comes to enroll. She hasn't showered. She's in wrinkled clothes. She's very tired. She's at enrollment, getting ready to enroll, and on the first page of her enrollment packet, she completes the McKinney-Vento screener form, which looks like this. And the first question says, where do you and your family currently live? And she, ch she checks off staying temporarily with friends, relatives, or other people couch surfing, right? This then triggers a different conversation for this student so that she then goes to talk with the McKinney-Vento liaison who gets some more information about her living situation. And she is then determined to be eligible for McKinney-Vento, which leads to her having very specific rights under this program. So first, she has a right to remain in her same school and receive transportation or to immediately enroll in the new school, even if she doesn't have the records normally required for enrollment. So Brittany comes, let's say Brittany is in Bangor. She's staying with friends in Bangor. She used to live in Orono. She last went to school at Orono High School. And she goes to Bangor High School and says, yep, I need to, I need to sign up for school. They determine she's eligible for McKinney-Vento and they say, hey, do you wanna keep going in Orono? Or do you want to come to Bangor? Most of the time, students will decide and in, it will be in their best interest for them to continue in the same school and receive transportation. So Brittany would say, yeah, I want to stay in Orono. I have my teachers I know, my friends, my groups, all my credits. I don't want to lose that. Let me stay in Orono and I'll, and I'll get a ride every day, right? Like the school will do transportation or I'll get mileage reimbursement, whatever it is. And that's usually how it goes for McKinney Vento. Sometimes you'll have a student or family who says, you know what, we had a really bad experience in Orono. I have, you know, my family is there and we ha we're having a lot of family issues. I would rather have a fresh start and enroll immediately in Bangor schools even though I don't have proof of residency, I don't have my immunization documents, whatever it might be, that could not be a barrier to her immediately enrolling. So, um, 
So let's say Brittany says, yes, I want to keep going to Orono, have all my credits, not have to worry about that. I'm going to, she's going to receive transportation. The school can purchase her a cell phone so they can communicate about that transportation. She'll sign up for, she'll get signed up for free meals automatically. She does not need to complete any paperwork. She can get help with referrals for health, mental health, dental, um, referrals for housing, referrals for substance use, whatever it might be, tutoring, school supplies, even access to showers and laundry. You know, does the school have these facilities that Brittany would be able to use before school or after school? Can there be some agreement made? And even storage. Um, so could she have an extra locker for her belongings? Is there any extra space where she could keep things because she is in between places? And so with all of this support, we're looking at Brittany has a much better chance of success because all these other needs are being met, right? And when we go back to the first story, I do want to tell you that story does have a happy ending. So Brittany, Brittany's first story was the true story. She was eligible for McKinney-Vento for most of her education. She was never determined eligible. Nobody ever realized in a school situation. Um, she did, however, um, she dropped out of school a few times. She went to her local adult education, ended up getting her high school equivalency. She's a proud mother. And she now serves on the Maine Youth Action Board, advising programs statewide about homelessness and young adults and children. And she had a really big part in developing the materials that we are talking about today and that we do in any of our presentations or any of our um, meetings that we run. So her goal, along with the amazing team at the Maine Youth Action Board, is how can we make it better for future kids, right? So that what happened to us doesn't happen to them and how can we improve these systems? And so Brittany is not her real name, but she is a real person who has um, done amazing work on behalf of, of all children in the state of Maine um, based on her experiences. And one young person in the Maine Youth Action Board said, there are so many resources out there. I wish I would have known the power of McKinney-Vento, right? Because when you look at a normal, when you look at a school, you don't think you can enroll without proof of residency. You don't think there's a way you could go to school even if you live out of district. These are all things that somebody has to tell you are your rights. Um, and if the families that you're working with don't know that, they're not going to know to advocate for that or to ask for that in the first place. Okay. So what I want us to do is take a few minutes in breakout rooms where you can just talk about what we have discussed so far. What made the difference in the two stories? What can you bring back to your district or your organization? Um, what questions do you have? Okay, so we are going to do the breakout rooms. Question about the subgrant chart. Yes, Ari, go ahead. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering how districts, um, like how you decide how much funding districts get, and if you might be able to say a little bit more about how the money is able to be used. The subgrant chart for the multilingual or in general subgrant? Um, for the multilingual. Yes. So that um, that amount was allocated by the um, federal federal relief aid team based on an amount of identified homeless and multilingual students that they had reported. Um, and that funding can be used for anything related to McKinney-Vento. So any of the allowable uses there, which again, I love this program because our last allowable use is any other extraordinary assistance needed for the child to be able to access their education. So it's pretty broad for federal funding. Um, and then also for the same for the multilingual for allowable expenses on, under multilingual. And there's more info coming on that soon from, from their team. All right, have you seen this graphic, this image before? I can't really see everybody. So this is one where you can see either the, you see an older woman's profile or you see a younger woman looking away. Um, we put this up here just to remind folks that we are always bringing our own experiences to every interaction, right? We're bringing biases, what views are we seeing? 
what judgments and myths are we believing? Um, there's always a mental imagery about folks who are experiencing homelessness, and we are going to have those stereotypes and biases in our own minds just as being people in a society, right? Um, so there's a lot of stereotypes about being unwilling to work, substance use problems, whatever other things that there are, right? When we work with our students and families, how can we put those aside, be very aware of those, and instead focus on the resilience, the determination, the adaptability, and at the end of the day, that these are kids, right? It doesn't matter what choices we think that their parents had available to them. We are talking about keeping children in school and that there's there's no judgment there. There's no looking at what the situation is and making decisions on, oh, well, you should if only you did it this way, right? We instead are just looking at how do we keep kids in school every day around caring adults. And another main youth action board member she she asked me, can you put this in your in every presentation you do with teachers? She said, please tell the teachers my mom was doing the best she could. She was working three jobs and we still didn't have a stable place to live. Right. I think there's a lot of folks here, um, especially the folks with who have the experience from our community based organizations who see who see this every day. Right. We are in a very unique time in history with a significant housing crisis. There, there is not affordable housing in our state, in any community. You cannot work minimum wage job and be able to afford an apartment at market rate, right? Um, so it's really, really important that we set aside any of those judgments or beliefs that we have and instead recognize this can happen to any of us, right? A tree could fall on your house tomorrow and suddenly your home is not inhabitable, right? There, and we're supposed to get snow tomorrow too, by the way, speaking of weather. <laughs> um, this, is a, this is a list of things that just help folks to recognize that this could happen to anyone at any time, right? There could be a domestic dispute and suddenly home is no longer safe for me, right? It's not always about your economic situation. Um, it's also any other circumstance that could happen. And so my goal with, with these presentations, with working on McKinney-Vento, is really raising awareness that this program exists and that it's an essential backbone to our schools and communities because it says any of us can fall across hard times. And if and when that happens, our schools will be there to support our children, right? That's the fundamental piece is that this could happen to anyone. And we all should know about it because it is already happening in our communities. And it's a resource that's there for our students. And so this is a quick reminder on some of the language. Um, I try not to use homeless as much as I can. <laughs> um, a lot of families will say, we're not homeless. Don't call me that. I don't want a handout, right? Um, but instead to talk about families in transition, families in between places, McKinney-Vento students. Um, recognizing homelessness is a temporary condition. So we wouldn't say this is a homeless person. We would say this is a person experiencing homelessness, right? It's not inherent to who they are. And so another way that I talk about this is really saying, you know, are you in a temporary living situation? Your family could get extra support from your child's school with this program. And if you're not staying in your own home right now, talk to your child's school about it. Every school has a specific staff person whose job it is, is to support students in these situations. So every public school district in the country is required to have a McKinney-Vento liaison who is there to support students um, who are in temporary living situations. And so when we get into the definitions, we can see these are, um, this is what the federal definition says. For education, homelessness is defined as lacking a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. I remember this as FAR, F-A-R, fixed, adequate, and regular. It only has to be missing one of those in order to be eligible. So if it's not fixed, or it's not regular, or it's not adequate, then it would be eligible for McKinney-Vento. Fortunately, they give us some really specific examples. 
So the first one is sharing housing due to a loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason. So this might be your students who have run away, who've been kicked out, who, um, who are couch surfing, who are doubled up with another family, right? Most of the time, if you're sharing housing, it is because of this, right? It is very, very rare where we will have families who are sharing housing and it doesn't have a relation to loss of housing or economic hardship, um, but that is possible. The next one we have is students living in hotels, motels due to a lack of adequate housing. I'm assuming you all have seen this quite a bit with our emergency rental assistance. Um, trailers or camping grounds due to a lack of adequate housing. With this one, my brother and his family, they got um, a fifth wheel and they travel all over the country and that is what they're doing right now. And they're, you know, that's what they're doing. They are not eligible for McKinney Vento because it is not due to a lack of adequate housing. If my brother showed up with his fifth wheel on my front lawn and said, we have nowhere else to go, can we stay here while I'm looking for a permanent place, then they would be eligible, right? If they'd been evicted and now they're living in their trailer. But instead, when it's um, not due to a lack of adequate housing, it would not be eligible. We have students living in emergency or transitional shelters, children abandoned at hospitals. This one is specifically written into the law and it's a little extra heartbreaking. Um, this is often due to mental health challenges or behavioral challenges where the family doesn't feel equipped to care for the child at home, um, but it does happen in our state. Um, families who are living in cars, parks, public spaces, or abandoned buildings, substandard housing. So when we talk about McKinney-Vento, we talk a lot about in a temporary living situation, which covers all the other ones, and then there's also substandard housing. So if the housing is not adequate, the child would be eligible for McKinney-Vento. So they might have a roof over their head. They might have lived there for many years and it is their home. But if they don't have heat, electricity, water, if it's not safe, if it's infested with vermin, pests, or mold, if it's lacking a kitchen or a toilet, if it has any unreasonable dangers to people, then it would be considered substandard. If it's over overcrowded, that's another one. So does does the child have their own bed to sleep in? If they do not, that is substandard housing and would be eligible for McKinney-Vento. So a child sleeping on a couch is eligible for McKinney-Vento. Um, this, this one is really surprising for most people, and I'm trying to really raise awareness about that. And then the law does specifically include migratory students living in one of the previously mentioned situations. As I mentioned, I worked with the Migrant Education Program. I have been to most of the farm labor camps around our state, and I can tell you none of them were adequate. Oops, I'm going to mute Steve there. <laughs> um, so migrant students, they're also in employer-provided housing. That in and of itself is a temporary housing situation, right? So we have um, a lot of students who are eligible for different programs um, throughout and often for McKinney-Vento. And so another way to look at it, can the student go to the same place every night to sleep in a safe and sufficient space? If the answer to any of those bubbles is no, then the child will be eligible for McKinney-Vento services. And this is from any point for the school year, which would be July 1 of the current year, if they experience any of these situations, they would then be eligible and carry that McKinney-Vento flag through the end of the school year. Because again, our whole goal is educational stability. We want to keep them in the same school for that whole school year and connected to services. Um, all right, so I have a poll. I have another poll for you, which is just what are the eligibility situations you have seen so far this school year? in some of the um, listed out ones from that we just talked about. So really think, do you know families who've been in these situations already this school year?
All right, gonna give you 10 more seconds. Looks like most of us have participated. All right, so let's share the results. So it looks like we're seeing a lot of sharing housing, unsheltered, wow, that one is surprising. Hotels, motels, shelters, campgrounds, students who ran away or were kicked out and substandard housing, yeah. Um, if you are of the 30% of people who did not select substandard housing, I do just want to challenge you to explore that a little bit more in your community because I do I do genuinely genuinely believe we have substandard housing in every community in Maine, even if you're in Cape Elizabeth or Falmouth or wherever you are, there are situations of substandard housing. Um, so really think about how can you um, explore that a little bit more with your community. But yeah, definitely the majority here is sharing housing due to a loss of housing. That's the majority that we see with our data in Maine as well as nationally. So our definition of homeless is a little bit um, more flexible than other federal agencies. And our definition includes sharing housing due to a loss of housing. And that is the biggest percentage of our students. It's around 60% both in Maine and nationally, of all McKinney-Vento students that are identified. Any questions on this, on the eligibility piece? We'll get into some more details on it, but I do wanna just pause for one moment if anyone has questions. Okay. You can always put it in the chat too. All right, so what particular rights are there for these students? What's the purpose of identifying them? They can get free meals, school supplies, including PPE, transportation, transportation to their school of origin or immediate enrollment without normally required documents like we talked about, clothing and hygiene items, it's really important, referrals, mentoring, connections to community, and maybe even access to showers and laundry and other resources at the school building. And this goes for the entire school year, even if they become stably housed partway through the year, right? So if I am in a DV, in a domestic violence shelter with my children, September and October, they're identified for McKinney-Vento. I then move into a, an apartment with a lease in November, my kids are still eligible for McKinney-Vento through that entire year and can continue receiving that support through the following June. Oops. So school of origin, what school can the child go to? Sometimes people think McKinney-Vento means school choice, which is a problematic idea because that's not exactly what it is, right? Students have, we have to do a best interest determination between their school of origin or their school of current residence, where they're currently staying. And the school of origin could be where they last attended, the school they last were actively participating in, or the school they attended when they were permanently housed. So that's a really important um, consideration where, especially when we have our highly mobile students, which McKinney-Vento students are part of that category, they may have been in multiple schools um, over the year, right? More than two, more than three. And the school of origin is really, it's not just what was their last school, but it could be what was the school they attended when they were permanently housed, right? That last stable living situation. And another one of my favorite things about this program is McKinney-Vento doesn't just say they need to be in the school for the whole school day, which it does say, but it also says if they want to do extracurriculars, they need to be able to do that to actively participate in all of their education, right? So that might mean being on the soccer team and having transportation covered if it's a barrier to, to participation, getting support with, you know, buying a uniform or any of the equipment that would be needed, all of those pieces. So that could go for any extracurricular that could go for theater or clubs, if it's school sponsored, then the school would need to um, support the student to be able to fully participate. So when we look at the numbers, we are identifying two to 3,000 students per year in Maine statewide. Um, this is about 1% of all of our students. However, we know that Mainers under 18 are at about 14% for below poverty. 
So we have a long way to go. Most national estimates have um, homeless student numbers between three and 5%, and we are only identifying at 1%. So we, I mean, Frankly, like we are on the short list for monitoring from the U.S. Department of Education because our numbers are so low, right? We have a way to go. Uh, we have some ways to go in terms of better identification and support to these students who are entitled to this program. Um, there's also some really particular uh, sub subgroups of homeless children and youth where we talk about migratory children, unaccompanied homeless youth we'll touch on in a minute and uh, children with disabilities and multilingual students. So we do have some other categories to consider there. And again, when we look at the numbers, the majority of our students are doubled up. And then that increasing number is hotels and motels as we see the shelters number decreasing as the hotels and motels increase. Um, and then the unsheltered component is, is relatively low. Um, where we're, our last numbers had just 3% of students identified for McKinney-Vento who were eligible um, based on an unsheltered situation. Oh, Gerald, I so love your question. Thank you. So Gerald put in the chat, is there a private right of action for parents or students to enforce these rights when they believe they have not received services they're entitled to? Yes, absolutely. So we have a dispute resolution process that is up on our website that parents um, or students can apply for a dispute resolution um, where it would be revisited if they disagreed with either the eligibility determination or the best interest determination. So if the school said, uh, we don't think you're homeless, you don't qualify for this program, the family could file a dispute that would come up to our office at the DOE and um, be reviewed and be reviewed again, right? Or if the school says, you know, you really shouldn't go here, you should go to the new local school where you're currently staying, that's in your child's best interest, and the family disagrees with that, they could also file a dispute um, where it would be revisited. Then it would be our office who makes a new determination and if the family disagreed with that, they could even appeal that up to the commissioner of the main department of education. So there is like a two level to it, but um, there is a formal dispute process. Um, and I, honestly, it, that is kind of a thing to go through the formal dispute process, but parents can call me and I, I spend most of my days on the phone with parents and schools trying to help mediate these situations. Right. So it doesn't have to always get to that formal dispute process, but families are always welcome to call me and I'm happy to talk through the basics of um, what McKinney Vento is, listen to their situation and see um, how I can support. But yes, there's there's a long way to go. Honestly, this this law has been around for a long time, um, 1987, and we're still raising awareness about it significantly. Um, we have right now about 80% of our liaisons who have been formally trained in McKinney-Vento for this school year. But historically, those numbers were probably about 20%, right, before COVID, before Zoom, before being able to do all of this virtually. So there's still a long way to go in terms of raising awareness. Great question. Um, and so... Who's tasked with identifying students? This is really up to everybody. It's not just the liaisons, but like we talked about, a hole in the boat is a hole in the whole boat. You want to make sure everyone in your school district or your organization is well aware of McKinney-Vento and knows that these students have particular rights and who to get connected to make sure that the schools are aware of their situation. Um, so if you have a family and you hear them talking about, you know, oh yeah, we're staying with you know, kids tell you we're staying with our cousins for a while, right? It's, we're having an extra sleepover with our cousins. You know, maybe just bring that up to your local liaison and say, hey, have you identified this family for McKinney-Vento? That sounds like there might be something going on. I'm not sure, right? And, and hopefully they say, oh, yep, we already got it. Don't worry about it. You know, they're already connected to services, but they might be, no, we, we haven't heard anything. Thank you for telling us. We'll follow up and get them connected. Yes, Jane, thank you so much for that New York Times. So Jane just put in the chat a New York Times recommendation for a podcast. 
and the article, Young and Homeless in Rural America. Yes, um, that article, if folks, if, I can send you the article if you um, can't access it. I'm happy to share that. I had um, shared that out with liaisons before, but I didn't know they may put it into a podcast. That's nice. And so just another reminder that this time frame is for the entire academic year, and there's no time limit on how long a child or youth could be considered homeless. So liaisons have to review it each year and see, is this student still eligible for the program? Has their living situation changed? But you could have children who are eligible for 12 years of their education, right? We hope that's not the case, but oftentimes, especially in doubled up situations, it's a temporary arrangement and year after year, you're looking at it and saying, wait, are, is this still the situation or have you decided that this is in your best interest and now you're all deciding to live together? And families will say, nope, we, we are actively looking, we are applying to places, we just haven't been able to find anything, right? So really thinking about um, there is no time limit on how long a child or youth can be considered homeless. That's a really important um, reminder. Okay. Megan asks, does McKinney-Vento eligibility involve CPS involvement for Child Protective Services? Thank you, Sarah. Yes. So McKinney-Vento, so our role as educators and within the Department of Education and within local school districts is to make sure that children have what they need so they can go to school and be fully accessing their education. We are not DHHS. We are not HUD. We are not responsible or generally <laughs> capable to find housing or to resolve family disputes or whatever it is, right? We are here just to make sure that these kids can get to school each day and be present when they are there. That is what is the responsibility of liaisons. Sometimes there may be a concern about a child experiencing abuse or neglect where they are currently staying, and that would require a mandated report to DHHS and to Child Protective, right? There cannot be a uniform guidance for schools to say every time we have a McGinney Vento student, we are making a referral to, to CPS. That, that is not an option because that would be a barrier to families disclosing, right? It's really, really important when you navigate these conversations that you make sure that these are safe spaces where families feel comfortable to disclose. Yeah, we're in a, you know, we're in a tricky situation right now. We're temporarily staying with my brother. You know, we'll find our own place soon. But if there's any hesitation that that might lead to, you know, their kids getting taken away from them, they're not going to want to tell you that, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we build that relationship to make them feel safe? Right. And, um, you know, one of the things, um, Amelia and I have been doing this this fall, and I've learned a lot listening to her. And, you know, one of the things that she talks about is if a tree falls on your house. So, you know, here I am in the woods, right? And a tree could fall on my house and I might have to go stay at my sister's. That doesn't make me a bad mom or my parenting. My kids aren't unsafe. Um, so that wouldn't be a CPS report. It would just be that they could get McKinney Vento. Absolutely. Thank you, Sarah. All right, so I recognize we are past 10, so I want to give you all a break. I'm one student in every classroom who has experienced homelessness this school year, and that's a really important way to consider, and it's a good way for my brain to better understand the numbers. So you can go to this website here and look up your local district and see the total number of students enrolled versus um, homeless students and really see some details on what has happened um, in your district related to McKinney-Vento over the past few years. It's a great um, public resource that's there. SRO is their safe person. That might be the case, right? And that SRO might be the one person who has the best relationship with that student out of everyone in the school. You, <clears throat> you know, we see that sometimes. But generally, for most families, <coughs> oh, excuse me, for most families experiencing homelessness, seeing a police officer come to their home or where they're staying or whatever it is, is not going to be a sign, a way to build bridges, especially when families are doubled up and there's a lot of concern. You know, I can't have other people stay here. If my landlord finds out there's other people staying here, this could jeopardize my lease. This could, you know, my section eight, my whatever it is. 
So really, really think about who can you send that can go in a trauma-informed way that's there to build bridges and be seen as a safe person for the family. SROs generally are not that for most families. That's my spiel. <laughs> As would, you know, as would I, if a police officer came to my home, I would be very nervous about what that interaction was, right? Um, all right, any ideas about which age group we have identified most for students experiencing homelessness in Maine? Do you think it's elementary, middle, high school, or pre-K? You can pop it in the chat. I didn't make a poll for this. Or you could just unmute and call it out. Yeah. Any guesses? Nobody wants to guess. <laughs> oh, we got something in the chat. High school. Thank you, Sadie. That's what most people say. Thank you. Thank you. Amber as well with the high school. 45% of our students identified are elementary. Um, right. 1% preschool, we have a ways to go. We know that the first six years of our of anyone's lives are the times you're most likely to experience homelessness um, and to be in a shelter. So that's actually, we have a ways to go for preschool identification. We need to better partner with the Head Starts and public pre-Ks and get that out there. Um, but yes, elementary students is most of our um, students identified. My favorite theory on this is because it's the elementary students who will tell you everything, right? They will come to school and say, yeah, we did this crazy thing and we slept in the car. Isn't that so silly? Or, you know, whatever it is. High school students are, know, are going to know. We're, we're not going to talk about that. We're not supposed to tell people about this, right? Um, and so there's just a lot to think. A lot of people think when we talk about homeless students, we're talking only about high schoolers. But this happens in all of our communities um, at all age levels. All right, next guess. Is youth homelessness more common in rural or urban areas? <clears throat> hmm. You say rural? You got a 50-50 chance. Oh, Amber says both. Amber, you're so sneaky. How'd you know? Uh, both. <laughs> the answer is both. It's very, very similar. There's no significant difference between rural and urban areas. The funny thing is when I talk about this, when I hear about this at national level, most people will say urban. Um, people always assume it's urban. And then when we talk about this in Maine, people always assume it's rural. Um, and I just, I think that's kind of an interesting quirk to, to Maine, but it really is similar. So some people will say, oh, you know what? We don't have that issue in our community. We take care of our own, right? Taking care of our own means you're finding housing for someone who has lost housing, right? They're probably going to be doubled up with others due to a loss of housing. You still have it in your community. Um, this is an issue that is happening all over our state. It's not just around our big city centers and it's... Um, it's it's throughout the state that folks are losing housing and we have a lack of affordable housing. And then um, this is a new slide that I put in that just came out with our data from the 2021 Youth Health Survey that I think is really, really important to remember. Um, you know, we are dealing with so many crises at the same time right now. Um, and our youth and young people's mental health is another crisis, is another crisis, right, that we're all well aware of. Um, when we look at our students who are McKinney-Vento eligible and their mental health, it's even more of a crisis, right? Um, so really looking at, this is general population, main students reporting. We had almost half of middle and high school students did not feel they mattered in their community just a basic mattering, right? This is not belonging. This is not inclusion. This is not loved. This is just matter. And then around 20% of middle and high school students seriously considered suicide. Um, I should have put a warning before I got into these tough topics with you. Um, <clears throat> and I think, and I can tell you from the calls that I receive related to McKinney-Vento, we have additional concerns for our students who are McKinney-Vento with their mental health, right? 
Um, and so it's really, really important to remember with every interaction that we have with a family or a student, how are we contributing to just their mattering and their mental health, right? We are not here to judge anything. We are here to make sure kids feel belonging and inclusion and that they are a part of our school communities or our greater communities, right? And not just our students, but also their parents and their families. And so this was a, a slide that came from the National Association for Homeless Education Conference, where they said, we really need to be talking about hope in this, in this population and talking about hope with our liaisons. So these four core beliefs need to be there to be thinking about hope, to be thinking about a better future for our students um, and helping the students to see that as well, because we are seeing so much, um, so many scary things happening right now, right, with students and mental health. And so I know that this is super, I know that this is super sad and hard to talk about. Um, and I think it's really important that we do name it and we acknowledge it and then that we really focus on, okay, so what can we do, right? Schools have received so much influx of funding specifically for this population. How can we use that funding to, in, to better include our students, to better get them there and it really, really fully participating and feeling like they matter, right? That's just that fundamental feeling like they matter. When we look at homelessness by race and um, LGBTQ, no, LGBTQ, we see it's about double as likely to experience homelessness um, compared to their white peers or their straight peers. When we pull out T for transgender, it jumps to over nine times as likely to experience homelessness. Again, this is a lot of the calls I receive. Students who say, I can't go home, my parents don't agree with my gender identity. It's not safe for me there. Um, I've been kicked out. I had to run away, whatever it is. Those students, no matter what choices we think they might have, if they're saying I can't go home and they're sleeping on a couch, they're sleeping on a couch. They are eligible for as sharing housing due to a loss of housing. And that's really, really important to remember. Um, and when we look at the data on why students experience homelessness for LGBTQ, you can see the majority is citing forced out, ran away, family issues as those primary reasons. All right, I'm going to skip us ahead because I want us to finish on time here. So another important category, I guess I should pause. Any questions or comments right there on what we've discussed so far? Just pop them in the chat and we'll, and we'll get to them. Okay. I appreciate you all who do have your camera on. It makes this so much easier. <laughs> feel like I'm actually talking to people. Thank you. Um, so another important category is the unaccompanied homeless youth or UHY. Um, and so for unaccompanied homeless youth, they have to meet the definition of unaccompanied, which is not in the physical custody of a legal parent or guardian. And they have to meet the definition of homeless under McKinney-Bento. So lacking a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. They have to be both in order to be an unaccompanied homeless youth. So this is a child who, you know, maybe it's a teenager who runs away and goes and lives with their boyfriend and their boyfriend's parents. That would be an unaccompanied homeless youth. Yes, they are in a home with adults, but th those adults are not their legal parent or guardian. This definition does not have anything to do with immigration. It's not about our unaccompanied minors at the border. I mean, they would be unaccompanied homeless youth as well, but that's not a predetermining factor for this definition, right? This is just the education piece, unaccompanied homeless youth. Um, so we often have students who say family dysfunction is the reason they can no longer live at home. Um, it includes children who ran away or were kicked out. And the eligibility is all about their current nighttime living arrangement not the circumstances that cause them to leave home, okay? So sometimes we'll have a kid who's sleeping in their car and the liaison will call me and say, sleeping in his car, but he could go home anytime he wants. He just doesn't wanna follow his parents' rules. I think that's my next slide. Why should we encourage their bad behavior, right? 
And what I say is, where's the child currently sleeping? They're sleeping in a car. Is that fix regular and adequate? No, it is not. They are eligible for McKinney-Vento, right? It doesn't matter what choices we think they have. We do not know the whole story. We will never know the whole story. And we're not entitled to know the whole story. We are here to make sure whatever's going on in that kid's life, they're still coming to school. That's what we're there for, right? And so a lot of people will say, well, this is giving too much power to the child. And what about the parents' rights and all of this stuff? We're just trying to keep kids in school. And kids don't up and leave for no reason. The vast majority of the time, the research shows there's something else going on at home. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, substance use, <laughs> gender identity, pregnancy, whatever it is, there's so much else and other factors that are probably contributing to this situation. And we are just there to make sure that kids keep going to school and can get to graduate. Because if they can get to graduate, we are taking away that top risk factor for them experiencing homelessness as a young adult. And Amelia, there, um, Amber asked, uh, what about 18 year olds in the chat? And I answered that it's eligible for pre-K to grade 12. So you, youth, youth do not like, the definition of youth, I think, goes to like the early 20s or the mid 20s. So it's not adult. It's not becoming 18 and becoming your own guardian. Um, youth extends beyond that. Yes, thank you. So this is one resource we have up on our website that's really helpful in determining, is this unaccompanied youth homeless or not homeless? This is really a tool for liaisons. If you're not a liaison, I would say, don't worry about it. It looks <laughs> kind of complicated. Um, but this is really showing it is possible to have unaccompanied youth who are not homeless. It's very rare when that happens, to be honest. But let's say I get an awesome job in Boston. They're going to pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to take the job. And my sister is going to take my kids Monday through Friday. I'm going to go do that job in Boston. And on the weekends, I'll come back with my kids. So my kids will be temporarily staying in Brunswick with my sister. She's not their legal guardian. They are unaccompanied. Are they homeless? No. That is not sharing housing due to a loss of housing, economic hardship, da 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 da, da right? But if, turns out, we got evicted, Oops. And then I say, hey, sis, can we come stay with you? We've got nowhere else to go while I try to find my own place. Or, wait, hang on, I said that wrong. If I say, hey, sis, can my kids come stay with you? We've got nowhere else to go. My kids go and stay with her. They are unaccompanied homeless youth because they are not with a legal parent or guardian. I go and stay with my mom, but her house isn't big enough for all of us, so we have to split up, right? That We see that happen all the time those kids would then be unaccompanied homeless youth, no matter what age they are, right? My preschooler, if he goes and lives with, the, with his aunt who does not have custody of him, then he would be an unaccompanied homeless youth. Okay. Are you aware of unaccompanied homeless youth in your schools? How were you made aware? What was helpful? What was not helpful? Does anyone want to share a story out about experiences working with unaccompanied homeless youth? I can do teacher wait time. Okay. Ari, can you pop on and tell us how you were made aware? Yeah, um, let's see. One um, we were made aware of when um, the parent of one of the friends of the students that became unaccompanied called the school um, because she had taken the student in. Um, and then um, another one that we know about right now is um, a new Maine 
uh, one of our newcomers. So in living in a hotel and we were made aware from the hotel that the parent left. So um, one from a community provider and one from a parent. Um, and then actually we have another one um, where the student came down and said, this is the situation. Mm -hmm. And that's based on community partnerships, strong relationships with your parents, with your students, where folks feel comfortable to disclose that. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing, Ari. <clears throat> um, this is another another thing that I that I hear frequently, and I'm still trying to sort out how we're going to to get into it. But this is a quote that that I hear all the time from folks who really just come back and say, you know, I just, I can't work with this parent. They're lying to us. They keep changing their stories. They're trying to manipulate the system. N they never said anything about being homeless. Now, all of a sudden they're saying they're homeless because their superintendent's agreement got denied, right? Or because whatever, we, why, why wouldn't they have told us this earlier? <clears throat> I would love for anyone <laughs> to put in the chat any of the ideas based on your experiences of why people might not have told you that sooner, right? Or go ahead and unmute. What are some reasons that families experiencing homelessness might not disclose that they are homeless? Yeah, Megan. Um, any history of CPS involvement, um, domestic violence, that's a huge one, especially like with the people I'm working with in shelter. Um, those kind of go hand in hand. Um, if like one parent has full custody of the kids, but they are now effectively homeless, they don't want to be sharing that and have the other parent use that as an argument to get the kids back in their custody. Um, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They're kind of trying to protect themselves and their kids. Absolutely. I had a I had a dad on the phone the other day tell me, you know, he said, I really want you to know I was a homeowner. Like I owned my home and everyone in this community knows everybody. And I was humiliated and I didn't want to tell the school about this. This is embarrassing. I don't want the school to know. I don't want my kids' friends to know. I don't want anybody to know that this is what happened to us. Um <clears throat> And that same school was saying, well, why, is, why wouldn't he say this? Why wouldn't he tell us this? We've really got to think about how are we building those relationships and making them safe spaces that families know they can disclose. And it doesn't mean a CPS referral. It doesn't mean involvement from other agencies. Right. Like the stigma. Yeah. Absolutely. The stigma of it. Thank you, Jacob. All right, Sarah, I am handing it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, unaccompanied homeless youth and their IEP who have, um, who have special services. So this is a very small subgroup of students. Um, one of my roles at the Office of Special Services at the Department of Education is to appoint educational surrogate parents to represent and advocate for students without a parent in special education matters. Um, in the McKinney-Vento eligible group, there is a subset of unaccompanied homeless youth. So we have homeless youth, and then we have unaccompanied homeless youth, and then we have unaccompanied homeless youth who receive special education services. Um, they have a right to an educational surrogate parent. And that is listed as number four on this slide. So this is um, the definition. Uh, oh, sorry, not the definition. This is um, the law that says everybody must ensure that the rights of a child are protected in all of these things. Thank you so much for changing it. Um, so the this is also the law, the federal law from IDEA about what surrogate parents, uh, what their responsibilities are, the identification, evaluation, and educational placement of the child, and the provision of fate to the child. So students who are in referral to special education also have a right. They, uh, If you're in referral to special ed, you hold all the same rights 
as if you are already enrolled in special education. Thanks, next slide. Um, this talks about who's gonna be on the IEP team. Um, it's both federal law and Maine law. So the child's parents and some teachers and school administrators. Next slide, please. Um, any other individuals who have knowledge, uh, an individual who can interpret implications of evals, the child. Um, when I was a, a special ed teacher, I always invited my kids um, to their meetings. I was an elementary teacher and a second grader was in there once and the, the special ed director was like, wow, this is young to be in the IEP, but it's about them and it's their plan. So they should be involved. Um, especially if you get older teenagers, you have to make sure that they are, um, you know, going with their, going with their uh, plan. And thank you for changing that. So the reason that number eight is in italics is because it's only main regs. It doesn't come from Fed. So for a child who's a state ward or a state agency client, the child's caseworker representing a youth service state agency, which means their DHHS guardian, can be part of the IEP team, but the surrogate parent retains the sole authority to represent the child by exercising the procedural safeguards under this rule. Thanks. Next slide, please. Um, so any paperwork that comes out of the special ed office should have an educational surrogate parent's name um, in the name in the parent section. Thanks. And this is a handout that I send out that kind of delineates between a DHHS guardian and uh, educational surrogate parent. And I understand that unaccompanied homeless youth don't have a DHHS guardian. Sometimes they can choose a caregiver. And um, so the caregiver, and sometimes they can choose the caregiver and the, we can assign that caregiver to be the educational surrogate parent. But this kind of delineates um, regular education rights and uh, special education rights. So regular education rights would be like enrolling in school, um, signing um, field trip forms, those kinds of things. Special education rights are going to IEP meetings, consenting to evaluations, and those kinds of things. Next one, please. Thanks. And this one's really important um, to know. It does come out of both federal and Maine law, that for unaccompanied homeless youth, appropriate staff of emergency shelters, transitional shelters, independent living programs, and street outreach programs may be appointed as temporary surrogate parents without regard to paragraph D above, which talks about um, who cannot do it because of conflict of interest. Um, and then there's my information. Anybody have any quick questions? All right, thanks. Thank you, Sarah. So just to reiterate, we have our unaccompanied homeless youth. When they are looking at education decisions, they can do every general education stuff on their own or with a caregiver that they would designate, right? But if they are in special education, we have to go through Sarah's process, get an educational surrogate, and have another adult who is there to help make those decisions. <clears throat> All right. Um, so sometimes people will ask me, well, does IDEA trump McKinney-Vento or how does it work? And it really is that they have to they have to work together. And we have a lot of really good guidance from the federal government to, on how to make that happen. And Sarah and I are working very closely to, to try to improve those processes and be more available for districts if, if you have specific questions on these situations. But just because a kid has an IEP cannot be a reason for delaying enrollment if he's McKinney-Vento, right? All right, transportation. <clears throat> so Jane, this was for you, right? We have some resources here, um, mileage reimbursement or gas cards. For a lot of parents, the reimbursement model doesn't work because they need the money up front. Um, so can you do gas cards? Can you pay staff to transport students? Can you work with community partners? Find, uh, we had a district that got a, got a van donated by a local car dealership when they explained it would be for transporting homeless students. 
Um, is there public transportation, taxis, private drivers, rideshare services? Can you partner with universities, um, volunteers, retirees? Um, one option is having you meet on town lines with districts and, you know, having their bus take them to this town line and your bus meet them there and pick them up. But yes, transportation is such an issue. Um, and <clears throat> In Wisconsin, they partnered with their farmers who had CDL licenses, which allowed them to drive school buses without any need for additional training in the off seasons. Um, there's a lot of other resources out there. And then these are some from through, through the DOE that we have available. And Schoolhouse Connection has developed a transportation resource guide, which has a whole bunch of other stuff listed out, which I can share um, when I send out this PowerPoint afterwards as well. <clears throat> and I'm gonna skip us ahead here because I just wanna be able to cover everything. Um, <clears throat> so we wanna look at what are some potential signs of homelessness? What things may indicate that a student is experiencing housing instability? The biggest key is if you hear someone talk about where they're staying or need, needing to leave where they're staying, right? But then also being aware of any of these other situations, which may indicate <clears throat> something else is going on. And if you do, the key is to check in with your district liaison because they may already be aware of the situation and already have them identified, or they may not, and they'd love to follow up and get that student connected to services. If you are the one that a student discloses this to, um, thinking about how to approach it in a, in a caring way, right? Making sure this is not a conversation that happens in the front office with a line of students behind you, right? <laughs> that this is in a private situation, that you're having it in a conversational way, and also that you're explaining why you're asking these questions, right? That's really, really key. It's especially when we're in kind of this like fight or flight urgency stress response that we're so often in, I want to say these days, but I don't know, all the time sometimes it feels like. Um, it's really hard to slow down and remember, oh, don't just jump in with an interrogation, but really come back to where where is this family coming from? Let's make this a conversation. Let's make everyone feel safe and explain hey, I have some really awkward questions I have to ask because we have this program that might be there to support you. Is it okay if I ask you a few of these questions? Do you have a minute? Is now a good time, right? Follow up and really make sure that you're not causing embarrassment. You're, you're approaching it just in a really honest and supportive way, right? Um, respect parents as the experts on their family, active listening skills, and avoid using the word homeless. That is a big one. Um, we do have a McKinney-Vento um, check-in form, which has kind of a script to it that um, if you don't have a social work background or a counseling background and you're, and you're looking for that and that's useful for you, that is, op that is an option that's there. Um, that's up on our website and I will, um, I hopefully will be able to get you the link to that as well. So, so going- Oh, go ahead, Jacob. Um, so going back to the transportation, I work for um, Penquist Community Action Program. We, we cover the um, Penobscot, uh, Piscataquist, and Knox County areas. And I know that we have been able to set up transportation for children who need transportation um, back and forth to schools. So that is an option that you guys could look into in the future. Thank you so much. That's exciting. So Penquist in Central Maine. Yep. And check with your other community action programs. So Jane, who is yours? Opportunity Alliance? York County Action Program? Isn't that one too? So they might have some capacity. That might be an option. Thank you, Jacob. Yep. No problem. Yes, Amelia, I work with both of those. Awesome. Yeah, we're, we're losing somebody very important at Opportunities Alliance in York County, though. Evelyn St. Cyr, who's been with us for over, I don't know, 15 years, and she's wonderful, is going to be working for Maine CDS. So that's a loss for us, but that's okay. We'll continue on. Yeah, it's so tricky, isn't it? Yes. <clears throat> 
Um, I work for a CAP agency here in Aroostook, um, and I'm actually the Youth Homeless Demonstration Project provider um, for all of Aroostook County. <laughs> So I know it's it's interesting to see all the faces, some of the Aroostook County faces here um, for the liaison for my resource. Um, and I've definitely gotten school resources, uh, referrals as well, so. Awesome. Do you, are you all able to provide transportation for students through ACAP? Um, we are not, unfortunately, uh, not through our programming, but we do have different CAP programs here um, in Aroostook that can provide those. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for sharing, Amber. So I have a poll up here just to see what we know for the resources. So to see if I can skip over anything. It looks like most people have participated, but I will give you another few seconds to look through those. Just check off anything you're already familiar with. <clears throat> My poll heading, Amelia, um, ends with our already and then the F. So I'm glad that you added what it's supposed to say familiar with. <laughs> I, I realized at about 10 p.m. last night that I didn't input the polls. So uh, don't mind. Good for you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to end the poll and share results. All right. So half of us know about the DOE diploma and the caregiver authorization form, and now the student check-in form. Thanks, guys. Um, but everything else is pretty low, so we will discuss each of those in the next nine minutes, and you will still get out of here on time, okay? It's going to be a whirlwind. If you are your local liaison, here are some really key forms that will help make your job easier. The McKinney-Vento screener form that we talked about in the beginning. The best interest determination form. This is a checklist that shows school of origin, school of residence, and then you just check off which one is going to be better based on all these um, different considerations, right? So it helps lay it out very clearly. Um, the caregiver form is a resource for unaccompanied homeless youth and the student needs assessment check-in form we already discussed. Those are all up on our website, right there, forms for liaisons. Thank you, Sarah. Look at that timing. Um, the student needs assessment template check-in form. It also has some questions about what are your goals? What challenges are making it difficult to achieve those goals? Do you have an adult you can trust? Who is that person, right? A lot of our work with the Maine Youth Action Board is telling us, I never had an adult I could trust, so that's how I responded to my teachers, right? I had never had an adult in my life who showed me that I could trust them. And so I took that experience to all of my other adults, right? That, like, really considering how trauma impacts can impact people is so, so critical and the honesty of the trauma in these situations. Um, we had a question on mandated reporting. This is the way that we, oops, that we advise folks to navigate that conversation, to be upfront, um, again, from our Youth Action Board, youth don't like surprises. That's one of their key takeaways, right? If you are a mandated reporter, make sure you're telling them that from the beginning and you say, I am a mandated reporter. That means if I'm concerned about you experiencing abuse or neglect right now where you are staying, I am required to report it to DHHS, right? Being upfront about that. Um, and then the way we talk about resources. I have done <laughs> hundreds of these conversations with families and I have done it wrong many, many, many times where I have said, okay, do you need this? Do you need this? Do you need this? And just check things off, right? And families will say, nope, 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 we're fine. We don't need anything. But if you say instead, hey, I'm already connected to all of these places. We've got a bunch of stuff. I would love to get rid of it. Do you happen to need, like, could I give you guys some winter jackets? Could I give you guys these things? Going through it really specifically and putting kind of the burden on you of saying, we already have this stuff. It's here in the school. It would be helpful for me to get rid of it. 
can really help open up that conversation where families aren't going to feel the shame that comes with saying, yes, I am in need of this thing. I can't provide this for my family right now, right? So just really thinking about how you're navigating those conversations. Quick reminder about truancy. McKinney-Vento students cannot be subject to truancy proceedings if their absences are based on their homelessness. So if they are absent because they are homeless, if it's related to their housing situation, it must be an excused absence. This one we're really trying to raise awareness about because oh, it, it's an issue statewide. We have contracted with the community-based organizations of New Beginnings, Preble Street, and Shaw House for regional support for liaisons. So find your county and you can either connect with Signe, Hannah, or Stormy. These are full-time folks at these agencies who are here to support liaisons with tricky situations. They can help navigate um, resources, find resources in your community, um, <clears throat> and provide any other support that you might need. They are wicked smart people who've been doing this for a long time. Definitely tap into their expertise as we try to bridge what schools can offer and what communities can offer and really make sure that we're connecting all of those. The Youth Action Board is also one of our contractors. They are providing trainings for our regional meetings, which I have in a second, um, on authentic youth engagement. They're phenomenal. They are so cool. One of my favorite takeaways that they are sharing at these trainings is youth don't owe you their stories, which is a little like, oh, wow, you know, what kind of entitlement are we going into these conversations thinking that youth do? And that's what the young people are telling us. It's not it's not you don't know us their stories, right? That's that's a really important key takeaway. So I do encourage you if you are around to join our regional meetings, it's going to be an awesome training. Um, we also partnered with Gateway Community Services for culturally and res linguistically responsive support. So if you need some um, some advice on anything related to newcomers in your schools, they have you know their staff speak over twelve languages have a variety of lived experiences and are phenomenal. We'll be providing some um, cultural responsiveness training for, for our liaisons as well. So these are our upcoming regional meetings. We already had the Northern Maine ones, but you are welcome to join any of these. These are in person. Tomorrow we have one in Lewiston, weather permitting, um, but we would love for anyone, community partners or school folks to join. This is a McKinney-Vento programming roadmap. This is a tool for liaisons to really break it down to, all right, are, have we accomplished everything in this column? We're ready to move on to the next column in terms of job responsibilities and some ideas for how to build out the program in their communities. Do you guys know Maine Needs? This is my favorite nonprofit right now, hands down. Oh, maybe Maine nonprofit. They are single-handedly volunteer-based community. This is what community work is. That They're doing such an amazing job. Their whole idea is um, solidarity, not charity. And they are taking donations of good quality, clean, like new used things to give to people who need it. They have gotten out, as you can see, thousands of resources for clothing, hygiene products, um, like toys and Christmas gifts and all kinds of things to help families who need it. They are not open to the general public, but they are open to school staff, caseworkers, anybody who's working with families who would need these things. And they will get it to you even if you're in a rustic county. They have folks going all over the state all the time doing deliveries. So make sure you you bookmark that page because they are phenomenal. Um, quick reminder that our unaccompanied homeless youth can consent to their own medical care. We are working on raising awareness about that throughout the state. Um, if you need info, that's up on our website. We have higher education liaisons now at UMaine System, Maine Community Colleges, and Maine Maritime Academy to support students who are in college experiencing homelessness. Migrant Ed is awesome. Check it out. Help Me Grow is awesome for kids zero to eight. Any questions families have, 
this is a brand new one. Um, pregnant or with children zero to eight, they can call Help Me Grow and they will help them get connected to whatever the resource is. Um, it's really phenomenal. Maine DOE diploma. If you can't meet local graduation requirements, you can apply for a Maine DOE diploma if you've experienced homelessness or another um, educational disruption. So you can still get a diploma, a high school diploma, and walk with your class and everything. But if you don't have that one capstone project that they required in this district or whatever it might be, you can still graduate on time with your class. Okay. Quick reminder, information is not implementation. Think about what did we talk about today that I want to bring back to my community or my district. And here's a poll for your top three priorities leaving today. What do you want to focus on in your community and thinking about? Thank you, guys. I'm sorry, so many folks. We are so overscheduled, aren't we? Sarah, could you put the link to the... Um, to the certificate and the feedback yes. form in the chat. Mm -hmm. I can. Thank you. <clears throat> and really just thinking about what is your call to action? What are you going to do differently based on this conversation? And who are you going to connect with? And thank you so much for being here. <laughs> So Sarah, just put in the chat the link to the certificate. This is two contact hours that you can download. Um, if you are the liaison, it's important that you do that piece. And then we also have a feedback form where we want to make this most worth your while. So if you have any feedback to provide, please do complete that form and let us know how we can improve these sessions. I know it's a lot of me just talking on and on and on. <laughs> so hard to squeeze it all into two, two quick hours. All right, so our polls here, we're looking at the McKinney-Vento screener, outreach and coordination with other agencies, professional development. Awesome, get to know my local liaison. Yay, thank you all so, so much. All right, so. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> I know, flying through things. Thank I know. You and all. she, Amelia, was so great moving my slides so I'd stop talking. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here and sticking it out for the two hours. I really appreciate all the work that you do. Reach out anytime if you have questions. That is literally my job. That's what I'm here for. So it's never a bother. And mine too. And Amelia and I talk all the time. Yes. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Okay. I can stay on for a minute if anyone has any questions or anything too.